Big data is coming to your town. Are you ready? Are you excited? Are you a little concerned? Do you even know what big data is? It's all those photos that you've put up on Facebook and all those comments, even the ones you wish you had could take down. Big data is your Gmail, especially after Google searches through it and gives you that print advertisement for the next Caribbean vacation. Big data are all your health records that have been scanned and digitized and now belong to somebody's database. Big data is every digital video of surgeries in the United States. Big data is the satellite imagery that weathermen use and the data and information that the military uses from these same satellites in Afghanistan. Big data is IBM's Watson computer. You know, the computer that beat a couple of people at Jeopardy a few years ago. Wired Magazine says that big data, that we're living in the petabyte age. Do you know what a petabyte is? Yeah, well, let me, give you, let me give you some help. It's bigger than a terabyte, and it's smaller than an exabyte. That's helpful. Now look, we tried to make big data sexy, and we couldn't. So we figured we would come up with some stats instead. 90% of the world's data was created in the last four years. 90%. And for $600, you can buy a device that can hold all of the world's music in the palm of your hand. $600. In fact, the term big data is really new. It's only four years old. A couple, uh, some scientists got together and said, we got to call it something. Let's call it big data because nobody understands what petabyte age means. The question I want to propose to you today is, is all of this good or bad? Is big data evil or not? Is it something we want? Are we glad it's here? Are we glad it's in our town? Or do we want it to go away? The truth is that big data <laughs> is not really what's important. What's important are the issues that come up around it, ownership, security, privacy, and what we do with big data, what we do with it. So big data, to be clear, is not just at the Department of Defense in Washington or in, in some government agency in Sacramento. It's not even at the Googleplex up the street in Mountain View. Big data's here. My friend Zach, who I've known and worked with for many years, we worked on the Kerry campaign together, we worked on the Obama campaign together. That one was more successful. <laughs> I've worked with Zach at the Santa Cruz Police Department for several years. We're working on something new, and, and this is what we're doing now. How do we take this concept of big data and make it work for the public good locally? Zach's got a story for you. Zach? Well, I wanted to tell you a story about uh, nerds and cops. And nerds and cops don't normally come together for donuts or whatever it is we eat at the police, well, we eat donuts at the police department. <laughs> but we, you know, the government's facing a pretty significant problem and it isn't just here locally. What's interesting is what we're doing locally has international ramifications. In Santa Cruz, what we're faced with is the same thing that we're faced with across the country and across the world. In the last decade, we've had a 30% increase in workload at the police department calls for service. We've had a 20% decline in staff. So we needed to find ways that we could allocate resources more effectively. You can't simply just hire more people, even though we wish we could. And so I started looking at ways in order to do this, and I came across a paper that was written by a team of nerds at UCLA, a very complex mathematical model, an algorithm that they had designed after an earthquake aftershock algorithm. You know, when you have an earthquake, you know that there is a predictable aftershock. It turns out that when you have crimes, there are actually predictable after crimes that will occur based on that initial crime. So I contacted him and I said, would you be willing to let us try this locally here in Santa Cruz? Would you be willing to let us try this operationally to see if it works? And they said yes. Actually, they, what they said didn't make any sense, but I distilled it down to yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been doing it now for the last for the last year. So what is predictive policing? That's the term that they came up with. Well, what if I could tell you this? What if I, if I said that 
we could know where a crime would occur before it even happened, meaning that before you woke up and your car was broken into, your home had been broken into, your business had been broken into, we could put a police officer there so it never even happened. You'd say, science fiction. You'd say, Tom Cruise movie. <laughs> You'd say science fiction, and I would actually argue that it's science fact, that what we are doing now can actually do that. And in fact, it's something that we've already done. Right here in Santa Cruz just a few weeks ago, an officer was running one of these checks right where it said he was supposed to be. He looked up a driveway and two people were starting to break into a car. He prevented it from happening. The victim never even knew that their car was touched. Just took the report, arrested the two people. It was like nothing had ever happened. They woke up and their car was still there. So, I'm gonna show you a demo of it, an actual live demo of what we're doing in Santa Cruz, on the internets, to quote George Bush. <laughs> they said not to be political. Did I cross that line? <laughs> okay, so it's as easy as logging into email, and if any of you, since these are all techies out there, hack this, I will find you. <laughs> ah. Somebody hacked it. Thank you. You know what? You guys are awesome. <laughs> Don't let anybody tell you differently. You are looking at an actual live demo of Santa Cruz Police predictive policing data. I know it looks like a lot of boxes and a lot of stuff, and that's exactly what it is. Let me explain it to you. This is real-time crime prediction boxes for the city of Santa Cruz. There are 15 of them. Why are there boxes? Well, how do they get created? I'll click on one of these boxes randomly, and it says here, if you can't read it, that there's been a vehicle burglary in that little box. Now, what does that mean? In the size of this room, actually, that's about the size of a prediction box. In Santa Cruz, there's 13 square miles to patrol. We've now gotten it down to where we can concentrate our efforts to 15 500-foot by 500-foot locations by shift. Notice how the boxes move? This is the afternoon's job. Notice how the boxes move into the evening? That's tonight. They actually might move by the time tonight occurs. We can do it by crime type. Say we only wanted to look at burglaries, for example. The boxes will move again. Now, I get the fact that some people have some concern about what goes into this, and that's a valid thing to think about. But what we've done is that the entire model is based on place-based information, not people. The inputs include date, time, crime type, and location, and that's it. As you can see, what the police officers are going on are simply locationally based. And as you can see, it actually diffuses across the city, especially depending upon which crime type you look at. So a valid question, leaving the demo here, is whether or not it's worked. And that's a good question because I think that people actually want to know whether or not something works. Well, as this complex graphic shows you, <laughs> it has. In Santa Cruz, uh, in the last year, we've had a 19% drop in burglaries. Now, those were the main crime types that we were looking to do. The okay. <laughs> Credit Donnie Fowler. <laughs> the, in Los Angeles, which implemented the program six months after we did, in the division that they first started it in, they've now since rolled it out in a lot of other places in Los Angeles, they had a 12% drop. Now, what's remarkable about it is all this is is creating a new level of efficiency using big data for good. I mean, you can use it for a lot of different things, but here in Santa Cruz, we found that there are a lot of positive things that you can do with it in a very, I mean, this is a complex model, but a simple output. Why do I like it? I mean, other than the fact that it means that there's, a le there's one less victim, which I don't even know how you put a price on somebody not being a victim. It seems like a priceless thing to me. But what it is, is, as this is showing, is it's actually a citizen empowerment tool, right? This is your data. The data we're using is crime data that we collect from when you call, uh, when neighborhood organizations call, this kind of information that we get. This is yours now. This is, to me, this is the government actually coming back to you to solve the problems. Because we don't have the personnel, the people that we've had historically to do it. So I view it as a citizen empowerment tool, really, to be able to use the data 
work with the nerds to translate the data into something I understand, which is a graphic that looks just like this. <laughs> Donnie. Now, none of this happened by itself. Big data is built on the shoulders of giants. You might say, well, why weren't you doing this predictive policing before? What's, why, is it, why did it just happen? Why is it did something new? Wired Magazine, four years ago, wrote an article and it said, 60 years ago, computers made information readable. 20 years ago, the internet made information reachable. And 10 years ago, because of web crawlers, this information became searchable in one big massive database called the internet. Without the underlying technology, without our ability to turn data into numbers, remember the IBM punch cards? You might have seen them in a museum. Without databases like, well, Excel spreadsheets and massive databases, without computer power, computer learning, there would be no way to use this data. So I said, is it good or bad? Is big data evil or, or good? And, and that raises the issues and the applications. You know, a knife cutting flesh is a good thing if, you, if your appendix just burst, but not such a good thing if you're a steak. So data by itself is not the problem. It is up to us, it is up to our vigilance as citizens to listen to the angels and the demons that are within us here, not in Washington or Sacramento or at Google. It is up to us to determine the issues that we have to resolve about security. Are your health records secure? Is our, are our nuclear power plants and our electric systems secure? Because they're all attached in some way now to big data. That's why the computers want to want to be attached to all of these things where you think, why do you need a computer? Why does, the, why does the electrical plant need to be on the internet? Security. There's also privacy. You know, is it, is it in your mind a good thing if your, pub, if your personal health information is in a database and is in, moved into a big massive database of other people's personal information so we can track diseases? Is that a good thing? Certainly it is. But what if someone breaks into that and uses it against you to expose you pri your privacy. What if, who owns it? When your personal public health information is put up on the internet or put up in a database, you've already answered the questions maybe about privacy or maybe you haven't. You've, maybe you've already answered the questions about security, maybe you haven't. But do you own it or does the, ins the doctor own it? Does the insurance company own it? Does the government own it? These are issues that I'm not going to answer because many of them are not resolved yet. And again, it is up to us to struggle with these angels and these demons. So yes, big data has come to your town. What are we going to do about it? Thank you. <laughs>